Good morning, uh, good afternoon. We are extremely pleased to welcome you to this webinar on unpack unpacking the politicization of pathogen sharing, building from the findings of the recently published Covington reports on global disease surveillance and pathogen sharing. Following the COVID-19 pandemic, a new ecosystem for pandemic preparedness and response is being negotiated. Negotiations on a global pandemic accord are now starting, and the 2005 international health regulations are being revised at the same time. Both fora offer an opportunity to address the ongoing and increasing challenges in accessing pathogens and their sequence information following the implementation of the Nagoya Protocol on Access and Benefit Sharing, which could jeopardize our ability to prepare and respond to epidemics and pandemics. Against that background, the International Federation of Pharmaceutical Manufacturers and Associations, IFPMA, requested Covington and Burling, a law firm specialized in life sciences, to carry out an independent research project to map up to the current practices, rules, and actors in global disease surveillance and pathogen sharing for both physical sample and sequence data with a focus on the impact of the implementation of the Nagoya Protocol. Covington carried out this research between April and November 2022, and the findings are available in a series of four reports, all publicly available. The reports represented the first time that such research has been conducted on a global scale, taking into account in-depth interviews with 82 stakeholders in global public health, including industry, WHO, public health institutions, biobanks, academia, and NGOs. We will start this webinar with a presentation by Bart van Voren, partner at Covington, which will walk us through the main findings of the Covington reports. His presentation will be followed by remarks from Thomas Cooney, IFPMA's Director General, and we will close with a Q&A session. We invite you to address your questions in the chat, um, in the chat function. Without further ado, I will give the floor to Bart, and thank you everyone for making the time to attend this webinar. Thank you, Paula, <clears throat> uh, and thank you everyone for joining this webinar. Um, in the next 20 minutes, I'll, I'll be presenting some of the key findings from the research that we've done during the uh, last six months of last year. Um, and um, as Paula mentioned, there are four reports in total. And um, what we try to do with our reports and how we've structured them is really to look at the let's say the pathway of a pathogen starting with the outbreak of the pathogen how do you know what is out there and then how does the sample itself and or the data on that sample travel through the ecosystem that exists in global public health so we've got one report where we really looked at how does global disease surveillance work where we spoke to professors and 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 practitioners who've literally spent part of their career in a bsl4 high security lab on the ground in the ebola outbreak in the drc 2014 16 etc so really um, getting a feel of of the let's say the origins of the pathogen then we really looked at how the the, the sample travels um along um, international networks outside of surveillance or networks of biobanks that share uh, pathogenic material with public and private research entities. Um, it also became clear that we needed to look separately at genetic sequence data, so we did a report on that as well. And then really going through how do public and research entities in the innovation ecosystem, and I really say that broad, as broadly as possible because we're talking about pharma companies, but also so about public research institutes, how do they eventually get access to those samples, to that data? And then we identify the number of legal issues there. You know, it can be really hard to ship infectious disease material with air freight, major issue. Um, but we were, of course, then asked to focus on the Nagoya protocol because of the access and benefit sharing debate, because of the um, uh, ongoing debates on equity. So I'll, I'll spend maybe 10 minutes on the first three reports and then 10 minutes on the Nagoya protocol specifically. So how does pathogen sample and data sharing work within and outside surveillance networks and databases? What you see on the slide before you are the four networks that we eventually discussed in the report, um, the global influenza system, the global polio system, the uh, system for um, emerging diseases and pathogens, and the system for antimicrobial resistance. Uh, 
But one thing that you should definitely take away is that these are only four and there are really a, at least a dozen of global initiatives. So you have uh, quite a few other networks. You have, for instance, in animal health, the foot and mouth disease reference network. You have the global arbovirus initiative focusing on the vectors rather than the pathogens themselves. Rinse and repeat. So what when we got into this research project, we immediately saw huge, let's say, diversity fragmentation at global, regional, and national level. But we focused on these four because the influenza and the polio networks are the most mature, developed over time. The disease outbreak one, for obvious reasons, if you're looking at uh, how do you know what pathogen X looks like, and antimicrobial resistance um, being known as the silent pandemic, so obviously also important. So first takeaway, very fragmented uh, 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 system of disease surveillance that is out there. And the reason for that is, is a, a mixture of reasons, scientific, by which I mean um, no pathogen is created equal. So there's the seasonality of pathogens, for instance, influenza, seasonal influenza every six months, northern southern hemisphere has become somewhat predictable. Uh, but for instance, dengue, which has a kind of reverse seasonality when compared to influenza, also influenced by the weather, et cetera. So every pathogen has its different um, 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 behavior, if I can call it like that. Um, public health objectives are also very different. If you look at the GISRES, the global influenza system, um, it really is geared towards defining or to recommending at least the the the, the, the um, the composition of the seasonal influenza vaccine. So uh, there you can see in GISRES a very close public-private collaboration that has been built up over the last seven decades. And that's something that I also really wanted to highlight that really came from all our interviews. It takes years to build up and a, a global surveillance network really requires close trust between the participants. So something that we've observed in the influenza system is you don't have so much the discussions north versus south, commercial versus non-commercial, private versus public. So the global influenza system has really managed to um, rise above these, these arguably false dichotomies. And we've seen the same in the global polio network. So we've got quotes in the report, without trust, we would not be as close as we are to global polio eradication. Um, so that's really um, an, an important takeaway. Um, in the more recent, um, the GOARN, you also see that they are really more on public health response focused on, on the, the emerging pathogens. And we've seen some of the difficulties there because you don't have the all year round collaboration between different members of the network that creates difficulties. People don't know each other as well as they would in an all year round surveillance system. So major uh, differences there. Um, let me just then briefly look at how does pathogen sharing actually work? When we came to this, we what we expected to find or what we thought you would find initially is that, well, you have a global surveillance network. So I guess they share pathogens within them and between them, uh, depending on the public health objective. What we found in reality is, is quite a different picture. So if you look at the global influenza system, sharing of samples, is regulated under terms of reference that were drafted very many years ago between the network. Terms of reference are basically, you know, like, like, like a, a non-legally binding contract between the health ministry, WHO, the national lab, um, uh, the conditions and what it will contribute to the network. Now, in the other networks, we got stories. People told us, yes, there is sample sharing, but it's really just as a matter of practice. It's not regulated as such. Um, when we then asked, okay, so then how does pathogen sharing work outside of the network? Well, then in influenza, you see there is some degree of regulation on this, in terms of reference again, but practice. And for pandemic influenza, it's really the only system where you have standard material transfer agreement, the more transactional approach to access and benefit sharing as well when it comes to pathogens. Now, the interesting thing in polio is that we were told that sharing of samples outside the network is actually restricted or even prohibited. But because we didn't get the terms of reference and they're not public, we couldn't actually identify why or how that is. The other networks, 
sharing outside the network in practice, but really on a case by case basis. We also looked at data sharing. And there we were interested to find that the polio network has their internal database. So they've been looking and building this up over decades that they have an internal system of wild type and, and vaccine um, polio uh, viruses, but that all the other networks, they do not have this. In influenza, you have, of course, GSAID, the global influenza uh, uh, database, as well as GenBank being used, whereas in for other pathogens, it's really more GenBank that's being used. So we really found a patchwork in practice and, and not a very rigorous organization of how pathogen sharing works within disease surveillance networks. Now, on top of that, what we found is that disease uh, pathogen sharing, sorry, actually very often works just outside of the networks for surveillance altogether. So it, it's hard to quantify, but we got the impression that it's even the minority. When a public health institute or a company for R&D wants to get access to a pathogen, very often it will work through a network of biobanks, such as Institut Pasteur or the European Viral Archive Global or the American Type Culture Association and the BEI, so completely outside of surveillance networks. And very often just through bilateral relationships between a company and a public health institute, between a university and another university. So a very complex spaghetti ball of how pathogens are actually shared. And why do I spend five minutes on this? Because I think it's really important to keep in mind as and when all the participants look at what is being negotiated under the uh, pandemic accord and the international health regulations. It is not really a centralized network. And as far as we are told, it also cannot be. So moving to my next slide, what many interviewees told us is that especially these networks like European Virus Archive Global, like BEI, that or like the Institut Pasteur that has presence in Paris, but also in Dakar and other locations, these kind of network biobanks where you have a central virtual portal that offers access to uh, physical materials is really essential in order to respond to an early stage of an outbreak because it allows you to bring together uh, basically the freezers from lots of different locations rather than this kind of centralized approach. So that's really a takeaway that we got from many interviewees. Physically decentralized structures are uniquely prepared in these early stages. They are quickly to pick up a pathogen and will enable quick sharing with the R&D community. Of course, not everything is rosy. Even with biobanks, we saw significant restrictions, such as you can use it for non-commercial R&D, but not for commercial R&D, usually defined as you know vaccine or, or diagnostic or therapeutic development, where it could take even up to 12 months to negotiate a uh, commercial use agreement. So not ideal in the case of an outbreak like COVID-19. Finally, some a word on data sharing. Like I said, just uh, there is some data sharing within the disease surveillance network, but most of it actually works outside of surveillance. And then our interviewees and our survey showed that there are really two big players. There is the GenBank, hosted by the National Institutes of Health in the United States and collaboration with Japan and Europe. And there is also GISAID, the uh, early 2000s private initiative starting in influenza and also, of course, having had a major role in SARS-CoV-2 and a number of other pathogens. Often the debate from our interviewees went in, in the direction of open, controlled access, etc. But the big picture that really emerged is that both databases have really important merits and also limitations. When we looked at GenBank, when we asked, well, this is complete open access. There is no form of registration, no limitations. The database agreement is really open, incredible breadth of sequence data as, as some of the major benefits. The quality of the data, not always robust. The metadata, uh, but it is raw data. It doesn't allow as easy public health decision making and require significant skill on the part of the user. 
GIS-8, on the other hand, is more ready-made, was considered by anyone, whether it's North, South, public health company, the biggest player in influenza and a major uh, uh, public health tool in SARS-CoV-2, really a one-stop shop for epidemiology on seasonal influenza and SARS-CoV-2. The concerns compared to GenBank were that then you can't link that data from G8 to other databases, that it's not the raw data necessarily, but the consensus data. And there were some concerns over who gets access to what data and how that decision is made. So then, you know, the consensus from the interviewees was we need both databases the, because they are trusted as long as they can ensure access for all and as long as the, the, the global free flow of genetic sequence data on pathogens is guaranteed because that's what we need for global genomic surveillance. So that's um, really the consensus. That's the first part of my presentation. Now let's see what happens once you put the Nagoya protocol on top of this um, combination of surveillance oriented and non surveillance oriented physical and genetic sequence data sharing. The Nagoya Protocol on Access and Benefit Sharing, um, just a quick primer for those of you who are not in the know, is, is basically an international treaty to the Convention on Biodiversity that teases out some of the key principles from the CBD, the Biodiversity uh, Convention, and essentially says that countries may require a pathogen, in, uh, may require, excuse me, a permit to access a genetic resource such as a pathogen from that jurisdiction and may also require as a condition for to, for that permit to share benefits from the utilization, the R&D of that pathogen. Originally focused on, on, of course, biodiversity preservation, but given the broad definition of a genetic resource also is said to encompass pathogens. So in essence, it means that you may need to get a permit when you want to do R&D on, say, SARS-CoV-2. Now, by our count, actually, since the slide deck, it's now 138 parties to the Nagoya Protocol, so close to uh, soon uh, almost universal coverage around the world. Um, it's taken us quite a lot of effort, but we can with confidence say that there are nearly 100 different ABS laws in place across the world. Um, and that's just counting at national level. When you dig down into different countries, you usually might have also ABS laws that are different depending on the province or the region or what have you. So let's just say roughly out of 138 parties, you have 100 different ABS rules to deal with. We've also looked at which rules would cover genetic sequence data. There we came up to 39 out of nearly 100 ABS rules would also require a permit and benefit sharing on the sequence data. On the right hand side, you see that um, 77 uh, of those countries certainly apply their ABS rules to microorganisms and that only 12 have a public health emergency exception in place. So the Nagoya Protocol does require entities, countries, sorry, to take account of public health emergencies. By our count, only 12 do so. And that means that you might get maybe three or six months extra in order to seek a permit, but nothing really significant. Now, um, as a lawyer myself working on the Nagoya Protocol, what do those 100 laws actually look like? What does that mean in practice? Well, getting reliable information on ABS laws is really difficult and costly. So a lot of money is spent on lawyers, basically, trying to get the right information to both the public and the private institutes. So that's also important. This is not just an issue for for companies, this is really also an issue that public research institutes, universities, etc., have to deal with. So once you um, have invested into getting reliable information on ABS laws, what you find is that there is really a huge divergence. I'm not going to go too deep into what is the divergence, but you can confidently assume that there are 100 definitions of almost each word. Genetic resource is defined differently what it means to use that um, 
um, genetic resource, the scope of the ABS laws is different. Some apply extraterritorially, uh, so they would also extend the application of their ABS law to a genetic resource found outside of the country if there is some kind of link. So really, really complex um, um, in order to deal with huge compliance challenge for any entity having to, to deal with it. And then if you actually proceed to the permitting process, well, then often you might not get a response from authorities or it might take an enormously long time. You need to deal with multiple authorities. And once you get into the negotiation stage, there are quite unrealistic expectations as to what benefit sharing means. And this then in red is maybe the key from all the public and private entities. And that's at least two dozen that we spoke to. No one managed to obtain a permit over the last nearly one decade of application of the Nagoya Protocol in order to develop a medical countermeasure from a pathogen. No one actually got a permit over the last decade. And to put some flesh on the bone, some concrete examples, for instance, this is what we were told from multiple interviewees is the has been the impact of ABS laws on pathogen sharing. One example has been the new uh, Brazilian ABS law that entered into force around 2015. It uh, coincided with the Zika outbreak. And so we were told that local labs were extremely hesitant to share Zika samples outside of Brazil for the fear of being subject to criminal sanctions. And from at least five interviewees, we were then told that this meant that diagnostics were basically unreliable because they could not be tested against local strains with, of course, disastrous consequences for the individuals and doctors relying on those diagnostics. Quite a few other examples in the report, eight in total, delays of access to monkeypox, nine months delay in getting access to a sequence on Japanese encephalitis. Also, seasonal influenza has seen multiple impacts. 2021, there was a significant significant impact from a, a debate over whether or not ABS applied to the Cambodia strain with one large manufacturer telling us that the delays as a result of ABS rules led to a 40% reduction in their vaccine production for the 2021 Southern uh, Hemisphere influenza season. So real world impacts in the human and veterinary pathogen space. Of course, we also asked how our interviewees respond to um, ABS laws, like what do you do in practice? The predominant, arrow, so you can see that with the arrow, the predominant answer is that, well, we resigned, we can't get access to that pathogen, so we'll do what we can with what materials we can get access to. Um, Entities that are working on, on vaccines, so again, public and private, would just avoid jurisdictions, uh, would avoid samples from jurisdictions that have ABS laws or that apply. There have been instances of waiting for the returning traveler, as in, you know, it's an infectious disease, it travels, you just get the sample from another jurisdiction that confirms no ABS applies. And a few entities said, public health is more important, we will proceed at risk and let them whoever them would be, sue us in case we run into trouble. But also then those same interviewees said, well, no access or delays or these issues we faced have had real impacts. Vaccine composition suboptimal, like I said for Zika, uh, diagnostics not tailored or tested for efficacy, and also even lack of regional representativeness for vaccines. So a real tangible impact. And then to conclude on Nagoya, a couple of quotes. Um, Politics appear to have replaced science and common sense. This is a quote from an individual, but we've heard that in different versions throughout our interviews. Everyone also agrees that the intent of Nagoya is noble, equitable, benefit sharing, but how it's been implemented appears to have completely missed the objective and also the transactional approach of attaching value to pathogens, but not public health doesn't seem to work. So also important, I think, is that when we spoke to the interviewees on a confidential basis, whether it's public, whether it's private, whether the background is north or south, everyone agreed that something has to give. This needs to be resolved. How is, of course, uh, a different question. I'll stop at that. Thank you very much, um, Thomas. Over to you, I think.
Thank you very much, Bart. And I was very pleased to note that I'm not the only politically incorrect uh, person because you also call MPOX still monkeypox. Because <laughs> then people know what we are talking about. But thanks to everybody for joining this, sem this webinar. Before COVID-19, having genome sequencing along with pathogen sharing was really a niche area for research used primarily by academics and infectious disease experts. And I've seen this on a number of occasions, whether it's with industry leaders or even international health agency leaders. When I started to talk about the flaws of Nagoya, uh, people looked at me and said, what do you mean and what are you talking about? But I think the pandemic really changed that. It showed us how fundamental genomic sequences and unrestricted pathogen sharing are to global health security. And I think we all have seen, for example, the wealth of data. I sat for quite some time, at least twice per month, an ACT A principles meeting where even WHO, the slides they used on the genetic sequences, they were all GSAID slides and all GSAID data. I will share with you some key figures in terms of COVID-19. Since the sequence was published in January 2020, to be precise, depending on which time zone you were in, January 10 or January 11, 2020, clinical trials for vaccine began just 66 days after that. The vaccine was approved within 326 days after publication. And within the first year of COVID-19 vaccination, almost 20 million lives were saved globally, thanks to vaccines being developed at record speed and scaled up also in a record way. It might come as a surprise to learn that sharing data on pathogens, and we just heard it from Bart, remains voluntary which really begs the question, how is something so vital to our global health security? And actually, I've heard quite a number of uh, experts, including from IMF, say we shouldn't talk about health security because health security is linked to the notion of health spending. We should talk about economic security. Because there we can see the huge cost of COVID-19 on the global economy and the IMF numbers talk about $13 trillion uh, lost to the global economy, quite apart from the many, many million lives lost. And how can we leave that to chance? I will pick up on something that Bart has mentioned, that the Nagoya Protocol attaches a value to pathogens themselves, but not to global health, meaning that many countries may be tempted not to facilitate the free and rapid sharing of pathogens that is so much needed to respond to epidemics and pandemics. And I think we have been lucky somehow that the genetic sequence of SARS-CoV-2 was shared so rapidly. Reading some of the books about it, like Jeremy Farrar's Spike, I still wonder whether this was intentional or happened by mistake, the sharing. But one of the elements I've heard also from many experts, during the COVID pandemic, nobody, nobody really cared about Nagoya ABS provisions because basically everybody agreed that public health should predominate and should proceed. Now, my concern is this might change. And uh, we heard from Bart, and I will explain why I'm concerned right now, because it really goes against all common sense to attach value to the preservation of biodiversity of pathogens. And I'm personally extremely committed to CBD about preserving the diversity of our flora and fauna. But diversity of Ebola or the diversity of SARS-CoV-2, do we really want to protect that? We don't think that pathogen should ever have been brought into its scope. And some of the health experts have actually told me it probably was a mistake because the environmental ministries who negotiated CBD and negotiated and Nagoya, they were thinking about the flora and fauna, and there were not many health experts around the table. 
is pathogens are really not the type of biodiverse genetic resources you or I would want to preserve. We'd rather have them eradicate or certainly not cause pandemics as we have seen. What's more, the transactional model of the Nagoya Protocol allows countries to be in a bargaining position. I give you the pathogen, you give me something else in exchange. This transactional model, which considers pathogens or information as having value, applied to pathogens in contrast to flora and fauna is simply not logical. The findings of the Covington report unequivocally demonstrates, as you could all see, there are documented cases where access to pathogens was either blocked or delayed. They're not, as I mentioned, in the case of SARS-CoV-2, not in the case of COVID-19, but in many other instances. Research done by the COVID team independently find that delays or refusals for pathogen sharing have led to suboptimal vaccine composition. Diagnostics that are not tailored or tested against the original or new variants of pathogens are skewed and non-representative epidemiology and genomic surveillance. In my view, reasons behind the failure to share data on pathogens vary widely. They may be due to a lack of capacity, two national pride to efforts to gain a geopolitical upper hand. Over the past two decades, some countries have even claimed a national right to withhold samples or data on pathogens found in their territory. Surveillance activities based on the response to public health emergencies and development of medical countermeasures are being impacted by access and benefit sharing. And we saw from BART the diversity of these data banks, the diversity of surveillance mechanisms. I think during COVID and in the discussions on future pandemic preparedness and response, I see a consensus emerging that we all need to increase surveillance and certainly and sharing data and certainly not hinder it. What is concerning to me is that this could only be the beginning as more and more countries implement access and benefit sharing legislation. But as we heard, this is politics, not science. We are deeply conscious of the background, which has led to the creation of the Nagoya Protocol, and which is further compounded by the equity concerns that rightly sprung from the response to the COVID-19 pandemic. Hence why we are here today to talk about the politicization of pathogen sharing, and which we hopefully can overcome for the sake of global public health. We should also look at the lessons learned from COVID and build on what worked well, namely, the two elements which really helped us to contain and push back a COVID-19, although it took more than two years, were the innovation ecosystem and pathogen sharing. Now, with ongoing discussions on the pandemic accord and treaty and the revision of international health regulations, unfortunately, we may be on the path of replicating the politics of the Nagoya Protocol in both fora to the benefit of no one. When I look at the recently published zero draft, actually both the innovation ecosystem and the immediate unhindered pathogen sharing might be compromised if that would enter into force. The draft text of the accord does propose pathogen access and benefit sharing system, which is so transactional in nature, and again incentivizes countries to share pathogens only in exchange of access to medical countermeasures in the event of a pandemic. This is rather dangerous, and we really need to address it. I want to make it clear that the industry is not running away from our obligations in terms of access to medical countermeasures in the event of a pandemic. And we actually wholeheartedly agree that more needs to be done in the future to address the shortcoming of the COVID response. Each partner in the global health space, from countries, civil society, multilateral organizations and population has a role to play in the overall social contract to address future pandemic preparedness and response and ensure equity is at the forefront.
as industry, we play a very specific role in this whole ecosystem by being the ones who most likely also in the future will develop and manufacture vaccines, therapeutics, and diagnostics. We have done at record-breaking speed during the COVID-19 pandemic. Via the Berlin Declaration, industry has already expressed our commitment to early access, to learn from what went wrong during the COVID pandemic, namely companies willing to reserve an allocation of real-time production of vaccines, treatments, and diagnostics for priority population in lower income countries, and to take measures to make them available and affordable. This is our commitment to ensure access to medical countermeasures in the event of a pandemic with the 100 day mission in mind. And we hope that other partners step up creating effective solutions in preparing for the next pandemic. Actually, we have called this a call for social contract, because this industry commitment would not really work unless countries with manufacturing capacity, big countries such as the US or India, wouldn't also sign up to, oh yes, we are willing to allow export of such part of production. ABS applied to pathogens creates a quid pro quo that would work against our collective ability to stop pandemics. The international health regulation should promote open and rapid pathogen sharing. With regards to the accord, access to pathogens must not be held hostage to the necessary debate on access to countermeasures. We need to uncouple the Nagoya ABS transactional model from us being tasked and asked to come up with a response to the need for more equitable rollout. But we also need to be careful not to confuse the COVID-19 pandemic with public health emergencies of international concerns. My feeling is that some people see, oh my God, some companies, oh yes, they helped to contain and combat and prevent COVID from uh, making people sick and some people dying from it because COVID was such a huge pandemic costing us almost 15 million lives directly, indirectly, maybe even more, but also $13 trillion in terms of lost economic productivity. When I look at the seven cases where WHO so far has declared a public health emergency of international concern, I think COVID was the exception rather than the rule. In most instances, whether it was swine flu, whether it was Ebola in West Africa, or the Kivu Ebola, whether uh, it was uh, Zika or most recently monkeypox, basically you had to search for more than a couple of companies willing to run the risk, willing to invest. And we really need to be careful not to create obstacles which would delay and maybe hinder our ability to have rapid countermeasures in a pandemic. Now, we have already covered quite a lot uh, in the presentation by Bart. I put it a little bit in a more political context and now really look forward with Bart to receiving your questions and also hopefully being able to respond to, you, to your questions. Thank you, Bart. Thank you, Thomas, for uh, your interventions. Uh, and indeed, uh, we will go now to the Q&A. Uh, and I think uh, we can start with a question for Thomas uh, from, um, from Amber Scholes. Uh, the, the biological diversity of pathogens and detecting new emerging variants is essential for epidemiological response. Uh, while a transactional relationship by the Nagoya Protocol can impede rapid response, isn't the global viral biodiversity essential to respond efficiently and effectively? And doesn't this require an all-in approach on both the access and benefit sharing uh, sides uh, of uh, the, the, the coin? So I believe, Thomas, it's about the, the linkage uh, model that uh, is being proposed uh, and how we can address uh, equity at the same uh, time, the benefit sharing side of the equation. 
So Thomas, this will be for you. I think in, in general terms, uh, when we look at the issue we have, we are all interested in the rapid sharing. And I do believe that the, that's why also we need to uh, invest in better border surveillance data. But the issue, and I think you find it in the uh, Covington report, very nicely put, the global public good of pathogen sharing is actually the benefit for public health. It's the response for public health. And that's where the transaction, transactional model is fundamentally flawed in two respects, because actually, if you do protect the diversity of flora and fauna, you expect to get an incentive from the global community because we have all an interest protecting the Amazon, the diversity of the Amazon. So, but actually in uh, the pathogens, we really have an interest in rapid sharing for the public health benefit of the rapid development of tests, vaccines, or treatments. And I also want to mention something where, uh, you know, which indicates the absurdity. COVID-19 cost us $13 trillion in economic loss, apart from the millions of life lost. Based on Nagoya, you notionally would give a benefit to the country from which emanated SARS-CoV-2, which hit us also. That is pretty absurd. Actually, one could even say it's a little bit insane. Uh, the uh, second element which I want to mention is we have seen initially uh, in the early days of the pandemic, we talked about the British virus, we talked about the Wuhan pathogen, we talked about South African. Now, no country loves to have something negative associated with their own geographic name. That's why we moved to, be to Beta and to Delta and to Omicron. It, I, actually, it's, it's a little bit counterintuitive. We don't want to make a denomination of geographic, but then at the same time, the countries who push successfully against not being named, they would want to get the monetary benefit, which I think is strange. And last but not least, and I'm sure Bart would be the expert on it, at the end of the day, these pathogens in today's world, they're traveling fast, which means if you try to create obstacles in terms of pathogen sharing, it's still just a question of days or weeks until they show up in genetic sequencing in the UK or the US in a lab in a country which hopefully does have a public health exemption. And the only challenge might be if the countries who want to lay claim on monetary benefits to it would then want to have access to treatment, test, or vaccine, they might be uh, exposed to the challenge that the company concerned doesn't want to run the risk to be sued uh, in that country if they export something which they developed thanks to a test on in another country. But uh, this is really mind-bogglingly absurd, and I do hope that common sense prevails, but to conclude, I do believe that in order for that to happen, we from private and public sector, we need to come up with a response. How can we create trust that in the next pandemic, we will have a more equitable rollout of these vaccines, tests and treatment? We need to address that, but not just for the country from which the, the pathogen emanated, but for the whole global community. Thanks a lot, Thomas. And I have a, another question uh, uh, for you based on, on the voting in the Q&A uh, from Elaine Fletcher. Uh, have you as Innovative Pharma considered how you might be able to open a channel of dialogue with other civil society, civil society active in this space to come up with some kind of uh, consensus position that steers between the enormous risks that you have outlined here, but still assures benefit sharing of some form? There have been some scientific appeals in this direction, as well as the NBI experts, who have expressed concern very similar to your own, for instance, although they are certainly concerned with equity and access to vaccines and medicines uh, as well. This will be for you as well, Thomas, about the channel of dialogue with other civil society active. Yeah. 
Actually, we are extremely actively engaged. As you know, we came up in July last year with the Berlin Declaration, which I mentioned as our commitment, our response uh, to addressing the equitable rollout. I've been extremely pleased to see, for example, our colleagues from the Developing Country Vaccine Manufacturing Network in Pune join that commitment and also uh, by other biological industry organizations. And now I've been over the last few months involved in multiple fora. For example, I presented to the Act A principles, I presented to COVAX. We have civil society organizations present in both of them. I just recently presented to a vaccine a manufacturing roundtable because the equitable rollout also can be addressed through better diversity of vaccine manufacturing, for example, in Africa. And uh, we are really engaging hard. What is a little bit saddening when we made this declaration is that, you know, the activist part of civil society accused us, oh, this is just a plot to distract from the, the important IP discussion. No, it's not. It is serious. And I hope that we can find some of the language which we have in the Berlin Declaration in a pandemic treaty in an accord. But that will only happen if the countries which have the manufacturing capacity, as they had it in 21, do allow part of the production to be exported to other countries in real time and not the rest of the world waiting until every Indian or every American uh, is vaccinated. Thank you, Dr. Thomas. Uh, question for Bart. Um, in the context of AMR, the main issue tends to be mobile genetic elements that confer resistance in multiple bacteria. Do individual genes fall under the discussed challenges? Uh, a question by Alessandro Lasdin. I think that the answer is yes, in general, yes. I mean, there are quite a few definitions of what is genetic resource and what will be falling under the ABS laws. If you look, for instance, at Brazil, um, the Brazilian ABS law applies to genetic heritage. So it couldn't be uh, uh, defined more broadly than that. So anything that has a, a tangible or demonstrable link to um, the biological diversity of Brazil would be within scope. So there the answer would definitely be yes. If we look at the PIP framework, genetic sequences are defined as the order of nucleotides found in a molecule of DNA or RNA. So that's, of course, influenza specific, but still it would probably, um, again, be the, if, if we would apply that definition, the answer would certainly be yes. It also applies to the individual genes. Thank you, Question for Thomas again. Um, why pioneering pharmaceutical sector proposes open sharing of pathogens, pandemic treaty, Nagoya Protocol, CBD, but closed uh, proprietary distribution of vaccines, exclusive licensing of patents, uh, no waiver, WHO trips, pandemic treaty? Thank you. By Oscar Lizarazo. Now, first, you know, proprietary distribution of vaccines uh, in terms of we have seen probably the largest sharing of know-how technology transfer, be it in vaccines, uh, be it on treatments in the history of mankind. Because as of now, we have had 382 partnerships uh, in the vaccines area, 153 in the treatments area. I have to admit, I unashamedly believe that this system has worked and was built on the basis of a predictable legal framework. And I've heard also from colleagues from generic companies, from colleagues from a developing country vaccine manufacturers, that basically in the vaccine area, the only way to get you know, things done successfully is through voluntary business to business where you know your partner, where you have done your due diligence check on quality assurance, where you know that actually apart from signing a paper which gives them a license to produce 
you also commit to no technology transfer, know-how transfer, skilled workforce training, and helping out how to do the clinical trial, how to get approval. Uh, I know from experience, it's not quite the same in the treatment area because actually a skilled chemist can reverse engineer a small molecule in a garage or in your own kitchen. But I must say, I'm not quite sure that I would want to have uh, such one. And uh, I just attended the the uh, monitoring task force of Act A of member states, where when I look at the first uh, unlicensed antiviral actually was approved in one uh, country before the originator got the approval. And of course, there was nobody checking pre-qualification. There was nobody checking the quality. And that's why I believe that these systems and the industry is not only expected, that, but did deliver in terms of sharing outreach. But I do believe that the only successful way of doing this is voluntary. And it is, uh, by and large, B2B, where governments can actually play an enabling and facilitating role, also in bearing part of the risk in early stages. Another question uh, for you specifically from uh, Rajinder Suri. Question to TC. What is the biggest challenge you foresee in handling this situation and what's your recommendation for its mitigation? Now, one element, uh, Rajin, the pleased to see you <laughs> on the webinar. For those who don't know, Rajin Suri is the CEO and chairman of the developing country vaccine manufacturers. Biggest challenge, I think, is really to bring common sense and public health concerns. I recall a conversation with the late Pete Solomon, uh, who passed away sadly uh, just at the beginning of the pandemic. And he said, he told me, when it comes to pathogen sharing genetic sequences, there's just one overriding rule. Public health concerns, public health priorities need to predominate. And I believe that we really need to call out and make that. In order for this to work, we also need to be open and engage about how can we improve the rollout equity. Because as we know from our lessons learned document, which we widely shared, equity is not just a question of vaccine nationalism. Equity is also an element which companies can address by commitments such as the, uh, such as the Berlin Declaration, such as the Pune uh, Statement, which we discussed and developed together. But we only will succeed if we get the support from countries with manufacturing capacity. And also, I think we need to admit openly, we need to have search funding available in the future pandemic to respond to this, I think, uh, consensus that we need to have equity. And search funding means that any follow to COVAX, Gavi, UNICEF, whatever, should not be months behind getting the funds necessary to sign advanced purchase agreement. But I must say also, I hope that many people really read the Covington report. I was surprised uh, to see how many practical examples, nothing of the scale of COVID, but when you look at Zika, when you look at uh, 500 million doses lost on seasonal influenza, because one had to, you know, to change the country because of concern where the strain came from, because of concern about Nagoya. I really hope that we can engage in a debate about this. Uh, we have a question, I believe, for uh, Bart from Adrian Spielman. Uh, what do you think of the multilateral mechanism of DSI proposed at COP15? I think I can be extremely short, not much. It's adequate in terms of, you know, CBD in the traditional sense, the flora and fauna. And I do have friends, you know, in the area uh, of Amazon exploring to find new fragrances or things like that. But in the pandemic, oh, honestly, 
this was too much based on traditional CBD discussion. I know that Bart, you and Paula and other colleagues of us were there. It was depressing and distressing. <laughs> Just to build on top of what Thomas said, um, you know, as we know, there was a decision to establish a system, but we don't yet actually know what goes into the system. We don't actually know what digital sequence information means. Is it really just the genetics or will it be also, you know, in proteomics? Will it be at the level of metabolomics? We don't know. And honestly, it scares me because there is a very short timeline to flesh this out in the next two years. And um, it could be another Nagoya protocol or it could be a solution to the Nagoya protocol. Um, so it is concerning it, that is all <laughs> i'm concerned okay uh, one last uh, uh, question uh, specifically to bart uh, from elena uh, fletcher in your interviews of the various stakeholder groups were you able to capture any shades of difference in their observations or responses by sector that's a really interesting question so it has been really a privilege to be able to speak on a no name basis, so we always guaranteed confidentiality to our interviewees and we spoke with each interviewee an hour or more very openly about all things pathogen sharing his or her experiences from a public and private sec uh, perspective. Many interviewees also move between different backgrounds animal to human um, or from the private sector to to the public sector and vice versa and so. That's also really what I, I try to capture in, in some of the quotes in the report is that when you speak with, with people openly and honestly, there is less of the us versus them. We are for public health and you are just for, for, or for profit. So you feel that these discussions exist in the public domain, but that everyone is also willing to possibly you know move from these entrenched positions you do feel these like like you mentioned in your question the shades of difference and then and then as thomas and someone on the question this this need for a dialogue so multiple people also mentioned we need to maybe have a dialogue under the chatham house rule just you know uh, within some degree of confidence so that people can put their cards on the table for honest and open conversations so we, you, you do notice these differences, but that's what I wanted to capture in this final quote on, on the presentation. There's also a broad consensus, regardless of background, that something has got to give. Um, I think Amber mentioned that this global equity, that, that we need to get there. Bart. So we will be closing the, um, now the, the, the webinar. Thank you to our speakers and to all uh, participants so for joining. We hope that you have found today's discussion helpful, particularly in understanding the importance of swift, certain, and unrestricted access to pathogens for scientists to be able to quickly develop the medical countermeasures in the event of a pandemic, but not uh, only. Designing new, any new framework meant to better prepare us for future pandemics won't succeed unless all countries and stakeholders commit to sharing data on emerging pathogens straight away. Today's webinar will be made available on the IFPMA website if you wish to access it uh, later. Uh, and those who have registered will receive a link to the recording directly. Many thanks for joining and wishing you a great day.